in the last week too. We're going to pray together, and let's ask God to open up our minds. The Lord said he's going to come immediately after prayer. We need a stout defense. Um, that, that, that comes from what in the scripture says here, uh, exhort you earnestly and con earnestly contend. And the modern translation says stoutly defend. And so that's the purpose of this class. We want to have a stout defense. And so let's pray that God will give us that, begin to give us that stout defense Amen. for what we are uh, believe. Amen. Father, we love you today. We thank you for your goodness and for your love. I ask you to open our minds, and I ask you to bless the teaching. Lord, bless, as you always do, your word. Lord, let us hear it and understand it. Lord, and I ask you today, Lord, to make a force of us, a scout defense. Lord, for the things we believe. We pray this in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Brother Walsh, sit or come. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Um, we're going to start off tonight by just reading this verse from Jude 3. And again, why does it say just Jude 3? One chapter. One chapter. chapter. So there really is no chapters, I guess you'd say it that way. Uh, why don't we read it together? Can we do that? Our theme. Here we go. Ready to begin. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was meaningful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Yeah, that's going to be a little key verse for us. So it's going to be one of those verses maybe you want to put into your little memory bank there and just sort of go over it a little bit. Someone says, hey, I think you're being a little contentious. You want to say, well, I'm just stoutly defending what I believe. Right. All right? And um, so we're going to kind of start from the basics. We're going to start from the beginning. And as we mentioned already, we're going to go into Genesis pretty soon. Um, but tonight we're going to sort of uh, first grapple uh, a key question, just philosophically. And that question is, is there a God? Is there a God? Now, whenever you ask a question like this, there are a number of possible answers. But I'm looking for particularly three possible answers to, is there a God? Or I could ask the question, uh, is there a dog in this room? Or um, is your house on fire at home? There's normally three possible answers for questions like that. Does anybody know what one of them would be? Yes. Yes. Okay. So one of them, that's pretty simple. Uh, let's write up here. Yeah, yes. Okay. Uh, the second possible answer. No. All right. That's pretty easy. Right? All right. So uh, is there a God? Well, yes. Or someone would say, is there a God? No. Uh, there is a third possible answer that you could reasonably give as well? I don't know. I don't know. That's don't exactly know. right. If you're being honest, there's some things that you would ask about. The person would say, I don't know. Right. And, uh, you know, sometimes that is, that type of admission shows that you are actually a very intelligent type of person. Um, as you'll see here, when we begin to talk about these various ideas, these are the, the points of view that we're going to look at uh, tonight for a little while. And uh, then we're going to look at some alternate ideas. The first one we're going to tackle here is the concept of, yes, there is a God, which I would like to think everyone in here believes. Right. All right? And, of course, when we begin to talk about God, you'll notice I put a capital G there. Why did I do that? Why did I put a capital G for God? Because it's the God. Right. Okay? And so typically when I'm talking about the God, I'm talking about uh, that person that we refer to as God, and that would make me a theist, or I believe in theism. Theism is the belief of a personal God or gods, if we're going to extrapolate it out to, say, polytheism, okay? And you'll notice here that when we begin to talk about that, this, is, this word theism, you know, we use it, uh, theos is the uh, root that it comes from. Theos is Greek for God. All right? My name is Timothy, right? Or, as the Greeks would say, Timotheos. Okay, Timo means honor, Theos means God. So I am one who honors God, or I am one who holds the honor of God. Good. I'd like to think both. 
All right? But you'll hear words like theology, right? It's just the study of God, okay? Uh, it, it's a compound word in the Greek with, whenever you see ology, it's for logos, okay? For logos. So the study of God. So tonight we're going to basically all be the, those that are theist tonight, okay? You'll also see there are other points about uh, God, like deist or pantheist or others like that. We're not going to get into those so much. Let's deal with the opposite now. If, if this is a theist or theism, then can anybody guess what the belief is there is no God? What do we call that? Atheism. Yeah. Atheism. And that's simply the same idea, but I just put an A in front of it. The A for not or without or no. So the concept that basically there is no God. There is no God. That's atheism. So if we have basically a, a spectrum of points of view, we have the two extremes, the people that would say yes, the people that would say no, and we have those, of course, that do not believe in a personal God, or do not believe in a creator at all. Okay, And we'll talk about that just a little bit later. However, you'll see that a, a number of folks really fall into that middle class category. And uh, when we talk to people, you know, a lot of times we'll throw around the word believers. Are you a believer? Right. Okay. Well, a lot of these people are not what you would think of as believers. They don't know. Right. They don't know. And the word for that, of course, is agnosticism. Agnosticism. Okay. Whenever you see the Greek gnosis, okay, like the word gnostic, okay, that means knowledge. So... You'll we'll see it has something to do with knowledge. You'll notice that prefix A there with the Gnostic means without knowledge. In other words, they don't know. They don't have a knowledge. Again, um, this could be as simple as a person that says, is there a God? Chase! Is there a God? Yeah, okay. <laughs> is there a God? Yeah. Did notice how he hesitated there for a second? Because he was kind of thinking, I, I believe there's a God 99.999%, but there's, I'm not really proof of it. So he's got a little agnostic. In it. <laughs> <laughs> or there could be people that are very, very, very strong in their lack of understanding or their lack of knowledge. Very strong. We'll talk about that in just a second. You'll notice that basically that ultimate truth and reality or what we would determine as God is unknown and is probably unknowable. You'll notice that that's, that's, that's key because a lot of people that you may talk to, they don't necessarily fit the atheist point of view, but they'll fit the agnostic point of view. And as an agnostic, they are so devout in this, they probably believe if you claim to know God, you're claiming to know that which is not knowable. Right? Again, for the Greek word for knowledge. Greek word for knowledge. Now, uh, uh, let's talk about one more point with this. You'll notice that with each one of them, there are what we would think of as strong points of view, weak points of view, or the strong, also known as the hard, also known as the positive view. This is a definitive statement, okay, of what a person believes. So, if you ask a theist, is there a God? He will say, there is a God. Right. It's a strong, positive statement. Okay? It's a hard statement. I'm pretty rigid on this. I don't give a whole lot on my point of view about God. How many with me? Right. Okay. You ask the very strong atheist, is there a God? There is no God. If you don't believe in God, you're, or if you believe in God, you're wacky. Right. You're delusional. You've got something <laughs> wrong upstairs. Okay. Uh -huh. And then, of course, the very strong agnostic will say something like, if I get this, you can't know that there's a God. Not only do I not believe in God because I don't know, you can't know that there's a God. Strong agnostic. Uh -huh. As we'll see here, we're watching the rise of not only atheism, 
okay? But what we're watching is a rise of the strong point of atheism, right. okay? Agnostics and atheists have been around a long time. But typically, they just sort of sat and said, I just don't know. Okay. Now they're coming out, and they're writing books like The God Delusion, or God is Not Great, or other works like this, that are pretty much making it very apparent of their strong view. We also, of course, therefore, have the weak view. The weak view, the soft view, the negative view, okay? Well, I think that there's a God. You know how people are, well, I like to think, you know, like that. Well, I like to think that there's a God. Sort of, it's keen, it's neat, right? You know that when a person goes on the stand to testify, they drill them not to be a weak or soft or negative witness. Right. You don't say, I kind of think that happened, or maybe, or sort of. Okay? You'll also see, uh, uh, I don't believe in God, maybe a statement that a, a weak atheist would say. Just, I don't believe in God. If, or, if that works for you, okay, but I don't believe in God. Uh -huh. The weak point of view for the agnostic would be, I, I just don't know. And again, you may run into people that just don't know. Now, what's the difference between sheep and pigs or dogs? And Jesus was kind of plain when he talked about some of this stuff. He told us to not cast our pearls before swine. He told us not to give that which is holy to dogs. How do we know a person's a dog? How do we know? I asked Pastor Whitley that the other day. Because that's what I do when I don't know. How do I know if a person's a dog? He said, or if they're swine. Well, how, do, how do I know I'm not just giving out information to the wrong kind of people? He said, well, you have to complete the rest of the verse. The rest of the verse is, once you have cast it to them, they will then turn and rend you as well. In other words, they come out against me with vitriol and hatred. That's how you get sort of tips and things off. But for the most part, you're going to run into the people that just don't know. Right? right? Now, as we begin to talk about our belief system of God, we have some what we think of as traditional defenses. We could call them arguments. Pastor likes that word too. Arguments for the existence of God, and these are those that come up every once in a while in philosophies. Okay? If you're taking a good old-fashioned philosophy course, they're going to throw out, let, give me four different proofs or evidences or arguments for the existence of God. Here are four of them. The first one, of course, is the moral law. Moral law. Now, you can say people do not believe in good or evil. You can say that. <clears throat> but notice what happens when something bad happens to people. Or when they feel ripped off, what do they say? That was wrong. wrong. Yeah. Now wait a second. If there's wrong, there's right. right. If there's unfair, there's fair. Mm -hmm. If there are degrees of fairness, then there's ultimate fairness, ergo there's God. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Okay, you see how that works? Right. And so that, that feeling, that innate morality that we have, that certain things are wrong, okay? It's amazing that when you study, um, when you study certain types of, of, of cultures around the globe, that there are similarities in some of their structures of morality. They're not all at the same level, but there are similarities in the structure of morality. Okay, incest, for example, is something that most cultures do not trumpet as something that everyone should be involved in. Okay. Uh, Native Americans were so hard against that, right? The first thing that they would do when they would meet somebody of the opposite sex is they would begin to compare their family trees. That's why you had to know tribe and clan and all that sort of stuff. You wanted to make sure, oh no, I didn't want that. Yeah, that's bad, okay? So there's a certain level of morality that is innate. And like I said, the person that would deny the existence of God has not only denied God, but the, the, the existence of good. The denial of that which is good means we live in a world that has no morals. Right. Is that what you really want? 
It's as the Russian uh, writer uh, Dostoevsky said, right? If there is no God, then everything is allowable. The second point that we would say is the ontological view. Uh, the ultimate good. Now, if you trust me, you can do this exercise with me. Close your eyes right now. Picture a being that is perfect, pure, good, wholesome, kind, generous. Now, what have you pictured? God. That ability of saying ultimate good is God. Is God is what we say the ontological view. Now, why didn't you say Superman? He's not real. Superman's not real, right? Superman's a figment of somebody's imagination. But apparently, when you said in your mind, God, right? When you said, God, there's a God, ultimate good, God, then you acknowledge his existence question is, who told you the answer to that question? In the ontological view, the person that told you the answer was God. The ability to comprehend God was given to us by God. How many with me so far? Good. It's, it's, kind of a, it's kind of one of those things. You really be careful if you start to think about this as you're going to sleep tonight. Okay, you may sit up all night long and okay, thinking about God right now. Who told me to think about God? Wow, that's what it works. Okay. The next one that we'll see, um, if I can touch this thing right, is the teleological defense. Cause and effect. Cause and effect. What goes up must come down. That basically, Newton talked about the idea that for every action there's equal and opposite reaction. Causes and effects. Basically, we are all living under a certain effect. Ergo, there must have been a cause. Good. If, there are, if there are effects that go on, there is a cause. Again, do we have other ways of explaining the origin of the universe? Yeah. But this one works very well with the model that we have, that the universe is the way that it is. Remember Sunday night while the preacher was preaching? Okay. And... Uh, as he was talking, he was giving all the statistics about the planet, and he was talking about how far away we were and the cause and effect, that you stop and you look at that and you say, if we're closer, we burn up, or far away, we freeze. No, it's, if, 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 if the oxygen level is too high or too low, things happen, okay? That's the whole cause and effect. And you stop and you say, I see the effects around us, I see the cause. It also, uh, by the way, it also helps answer the question of sin. When you start to talk about why is there world, uh, why is there war, why are there famines, all that sort of stuff, you say that's the effect. What's the cause? Original sin. Go back to Adam and Eve. Good. Right. So it takes you right back into Genesis. Booyah. Okay. <laughs> uh, one more of that before we do something a little bit different. The last one, of course, is the one that I probably should have said first because it's the one that we're really going to start at. And that's the, cosmo, the uh, cosmological view. Cosmological, of course, <clears throat> from the cosmos. The universe. The creation. Okay? So, we basically say we see a creation. Right? Mm -hmm. Ergo, we must have creator. a creator. If I see a painting, I know that there was an artist. If I hear a piece of music, I know that there was a musician. Mm -hmm. If I see a creation, I know that there is a creator. I can also ascertain, right, because I believe in a universe, I can believe in a unit creator, one God. But that's another story, right? So that, of course, is that cosmological, uh, this, this idea, this cosmological defense that we can get into. Now, somebody would ask me, okay, good boss here, thank you. That's given me a, some reasons to believe in God. Now let me ask you this question. For the walk standard, why do you believe in God? Which of those four really stand out to you? I've got to be honest. While all those are good, none of them do it for me all by itself. 
the reason I believe in God is because I believe the Bible. Mm -hmm. Good. You understand? So that the scripture warns us about moving away from moving away from God's word to philosophies and vain deceit. Mm -hmm. So again, not everybody is at a point where we are, correct? Right. Right. Does faith come up by hearing? And hearing by the word of the Lord, right? Romans chapter 10. And so not everybody's at that level of faith. And sometimes you have to get people to a level of faith so that they can even receive the word. And how do you get them to that level of faith? Well, maybe you pull out one of these defenses. And then you say, no, wait a second. You said the Holocaust was a bad thing, and that's why you couldn't believe in a God. But if the Holocaust was a bad thing, then you obviously believe in good and evil. Good. There you go. You just by your own self, you prove the existence of God. What you are is angry at God, and you must believe in God if you're angry at Him, because you wouldn't believe in yourself. You wouldn't be angry at somebody that's fictitious. Right. Boom. I just used another one. Boom, boom. Smack them all over the place. Now let's go look outside at the creation, the cosmos, and you say, watch that. See, cause and effect. So you can kind of incorporate all this to get a person to a point. But well, let's face it, as a believer, well, my text isn't what it used to be. Genesis 1, 1, in the beginning, God created heaven and the earth. That's what I believe, okay? That's where I stand. Everything else is, you know, it, it's cool, it's neat. You know, somebody would say, it supports the Bible. The Bible doesn't need support. The Bible says itself, that the heavens were framed by the word of God. Okay, so that now it frames everything, it supports everything. Everything else is just kind of cool, neat, maybe helpful with a person who hasn't reached the level of faith yet. Now again, this verse right here, boom, is the one the devil hates probably more than any other. I know we'd say, well, it's Acts 238, but here's the deal. If he can get you reading into Genesis and believing what you're reading, then you see the need for Acts 238. Because you see the fall of man. How many with me so far? Right. You see how we become alienated from God. Okay? And you see why God has the right to make the rules because he's our creator. Correct? Right. Okay? It's not just like he didn't just show up, you know, like some weirdo is uh, showing up in my bedroom going, I told you to do this and so. Where did you come from? You know, no, no. Um, I step in my daughter's room every once in a while and say, it needs to be clean. <laughs> I am the creator. <laughs> I have authority. Dominion. Right? And if the devil could, he would, he would like for you to, to, to begin to question this particular <coughs> verse. In fact, somebody once noted if you can believe the first four words of the Bible, you can read it. You can believe everything else. If you can believe in the beginning, God. Right. And he truly was God. Then everything else is easy. You get right down to it. And that's why we have to stoutly defend this verse. Yes, sir. Because this verse is under attack. Mm -hmm. Now, we can sort of retreat and do that, Right? soft theism and sort of go over here into our little corner as he follows me in the video into the corner. I'm sorry we, we offended you because we have a church out there in Highway 16 down there in Haiti. We said Jesus good guy. Right. <laughs> Meanwhile, back at the farm, they're out being bold only proclaiming what they believe. Uh, you know, one of, the, one of the great things about the New Testament is the fact is how open these guys were and how they made sure. Uh, when Peter preaches at the day of Pentecost, he said, Jesus was among you, and he did, as you yourselves also know. Right? Paul says to uh, King Agrippa, he said, this thing was not done in a corner. If it wasn't done in a corner, why should we go to the corner with our little points of view? Thank you very much. We don't want to be offensive, and I understand that. But at the same point in time, we need to stoutly defend 
what we believe. Now, I will show you a picture of Bill Nye. The science guy. The, the science guy. Now, here's the, here's the deal. Uh -huh. Bill Nye, the science guy, came on the scene what, 20, 25 years ago, a, a long time ago. Yeah, about 60 years ago. And he framed himself, or was framed by the media as the science guy. And so what he did was he, he spoke to children, OK? He would show up, Lucy. He spoke to Lucy. Everything, everything Lucy knows about the science. His, and let me ask you this question. Are we anti-science? No. No, of course not. We believe that the author of scripture, right, that uh, the book written, uh, this divine book is the same one who authored that divine book, the book of nature, mm -hmm. all right? And in fact, we're the ones that are empowered by God, according to Genesis chapter 1, to subdue the earth, okay? Right. So to study and subdue it. How can we subdue it if we don't know it? And therefore, we, we apply science. So he comes along. And you'll notice this, this thing big, which is a, there are a number of these think big uh, videos on, on YouTube. We're going to go through what, what he said recently uh, about this point here. Now, here's the problem that I have. I have a YouTube video. That's problem number one. <laughs> problem number two is I'm going to try to play it. But if I play it, you will see him talk, but you won't hear him. Or I can switch it out. And you can hear him, but not see him. So here's what we're going to do. Since I've given you the words anyway to use your eyes with, all right, you're going to follow along as he says what he needs to say or what he feels to say. Pastor, did you skip these good people up here at the front? Yeah. These poor folks up here. All right. So I'm going to I'm going to switch this thing out here for a second. Meanwhile, you're going to ask me any question that you have off the top of your head. Denial. Okay. Evolution is unique to the United States. I mean, we're the world's most advanced technological. So, I mean, you can say Japan, but generally, the United States is where most of the innovation still happens. People still move to the United States. Uh, and that's largely because of the intellectual capital we have, the, the general understanding of science. When you have a portion of the population... Uh, the video stopped there for a second. Let me see if I can get it back. What I'd like for you to do as he's speaking, by the way, is I'd like for you to try to see where he is... Red flags, let's put it that way. Some red flags, maybe sort of check them a little bit as you're going through. Yeah, he's already said a, a paragraph or so. But let me start again and see, like I said, this is not, I don't have this downloaded on my computer. I'm always scared when I'm trying to play something that somehow it's not going to cut download properly. Denial of evolution is unique to the United States. I mean, we're the world's most advanced technological, so I mean, you can say Japan. But generally, the United States is where most of the innovation still happens. People still move to the United States. Uh, and that's largely because of the intellectual capital we have, the, the general understanding of science. When you have a portion of the population. <laughs> Sorry. It does not believe in that. It holds everybody back, really. Evolution is a fundamental idea in all of life science. It is in all of biology. It's like it's very much analogous to trying to do geology without believing in tectonic plates. You're just not going to get the right answer. Your whole world is just going to be a mystery instead of an exciting place. As my old professor Carl Sagan said, when you're in love, you want to tell the world. So once in a while, I get people that really, or that claim they don't believe in evolution. And my response generally is, well, why not? Really, why not? Your world just becomes fantastically complicated when you don't believe in evolution. I mean, here are these ancient dinosaur bones or fossils. Here is radioactivity. Here are distant stars that are just like our star, but they're 
uh, at a different point in their life cycle. The idea of a of deep time, of this billions of years, explains so much of the world around us. If you try to ignore that, your worldview just becomes crazy, just untenable, itself inconsistent. And I say to the grown-ups, if you want to deny evolution and live in your world, in your world that is that's completely inconsistent with everything we observe in the universe, that's fine, but don't make your kids do it, because we need them. We need scientifically literate voters and taxpayers for the future. We need people that can, we need engineers that can build stuff, solve problems. It's just really a hard thing. It's really a hard thing. You know, in another couple of centuries, that worldview, I'm sure, will be, it just won't exist. There's no evidence for it. All right. Now, uh, Pastor's going to come. We're just going to talk real quickly. What were some of the things that kind of stood out? Maybe a word or a statement or number one. Do y'all do y'all agree with what he wrote here? Uh, no. no. Okay. So how? What are something maybe you would disagree with? That you would take. Uh, in the first paragraph, we said it, it's holding everyone. It's holding everyone back. By your by your view of Genesis 1-1, you are part of the conspiracy of holding everyone back. How's that feel? You feel empowered now? That's awesome. Okay, something else. Yes. I have to say this one. The very first line, denial of evolution yeah. is unique to the United States. Now, I think what he's saying there, obviously the world is full of Muslim countries that do not believe in evolution. Yes. What he's saying is that the United States is uniquely Christian because the European nations have all, have all driven in secularism. Mm -hmm. And this is not anti-creation, this is anti-Christ. Yes. I, I concur with that. I concur with that. Yes, the Christ. Where it says... And I agree with one aspect of this statement, but I feel like you fall short. He says the idea of deep time explains much of the world around us. It does do that, but if you look further, it also explains the God around us. Ooh, there you go. Good job. Come on, Come on <laughs> Something else, Tam? Uh, he's basically saying that my worldview is crazy. Our no, worldview just crazy. becomes crazy, and then kind of stops himself. When he realizes he uses the crazy word, mm -hmm. untenable, itself inconsistent, which of course, yeah, I, I think that probably, I may be wrong, but the belief in Genesis 1-1 may be a little bit older than his belief in Darwinian evolution. It's just me. I think that, uh, yes. And wrap a little bit, he's after our children. Right. Yes. <laughs> you could tell that he is a, a, a someone who's uh, spoken to children, mm -hmm. right? Because he uses the word grown-ups, and that's mm -hmm. typically something you do when you talk to children. If you're a teacher, right, you say grown-ups instead of adults, right? Mm -hmm. uh, if you want, I, I love this. You can just hear it dripping from the sarcasm dripping from his voice. If you want to deny evolution and live in your world, in your world that's completely inconsistent, with everything we observe in the universe, that's fine. That's fine. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Bill. I appreciate it. Scientifically literate voters and taxpayers. But if you believe in God, you can't go to the university and graduate. Yeah. 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 We need, uh, again, notice the, the uh, deal that he uses here. We need engineers that build stuff. Sistine Chapel. <laughs> Uh, Westminster. Yes. Bible Church. <laughs> now we're going we're to take a little bit, and again, we're not going to beat up on the straw man. I'm sure Mr. Nye is a wonderful guy, but yeah, he's not being exactly honest or fair. I, I also appreciate the fact that somehow he can understand that America is a place of large intellectual capital, quote unquote that we're a literate place, but he does not see the connection there with our belief in God and the Bible. When chances are that's why we are a, 
illiterate people, right? And yes, I was going to say just through the whole article, he started out first. He united us as Americans, and then he separated us between the intellectuals and the Christians. So immediately, like what he brought us together, and then he completely separated you uh, as a Christian from anybody with any sort of thought or intellectual hold on society. He, al he also separated you as an adult from yeah. your children. Right. Yeah. Make sure that you don't. What he's basically saying is right, and, and maybe this is wrong, but it's okay for us to pass along our values to the children. But please don't pass along your values right. to the children. Because that's going to screw them up and they're not going to be good, literate voters and taxpayers. <laughs> Whenever I see the word taxes, I think money. I say, ah, I see what this article is really all about. <laughs> you want my money. Sister Walk said, you have a point. I'm a little offended at this Or he went off to become a, a preacher first, right? Exactly. That creation, that that concept only exists in 200 years. That's a very egotistical or prideful. Considering that Darwin evolution did not let this 200 years ago, somehow he has the ability of, through the crystal ball, seen into the future, to believe that we will not have successors. Now, that's a really good place for me to kind of transition the pastor because let's face it, if we stand over here in the corner, and I, again, I'm not I'm not against Mr. Not, right? right? But if we're over here, I'm, I'm sorry, you said Lake Church the other night. You got loud. It was, it was fun, but we don't believe in all this. Other people believe in it. Sorry. No, that's the way we are. Meanwhile, they are boldly proclaiming Right? Boldly proclaiming, unabashedly, unashamedly, uh, what what they then maybe, yeah, yeah, that it's possible to win to, to lose this war. I believe God will always have a remnant, don't get me wrong, but we could lose the culture war. Yeah. And we are in the midst of a culture war right now. Mm -hmm. We're not talking about physical violence. Maybe not yet, but when you start labeling people as crazy and people that hold the society back, yep. that doesn't sound like America. That sounds like Nazi Germany in the 30s, my friend. Mm -hmm. All right? And so we'll, we're probably going to look at this. I'd like for you to bring this again next week. I'm going to turn this over to the pastor. I'd like for you to bring this next week. Bring it. And, and we're just going to, like I said, just kind of systematically chip away at why this is not really good science. Okay? Why it's not fair, and why you know, Mr. Mr. Nye is as well. Right. One thing I want to um, thank you, Bill Oster, did a fantastic job. Uh, uh, absolutely fantastic. We we have uh, we have a few minutes. Uh, there's one. I'm going to address everything in this letter. Okay, uh, we, we will not have time to do it tonight. We're going to address the old earth. Idea. We're going to address dinosaurs. We will have a defense and an intelligent defense, one far more intelligent than the intimidation tactics used by these jerks. Okay? <laughs> this is intimidation. It has nothing to do with facts. Or it has nothing to do with ideology <laughs> or anything. Um, now, but there is one part of this I wanted to focus on. Where is it where he says when you're in love? Third paragraph, as my old professor Carl Sagan said, when you're in love, you want to tell the world. Now, I, A, what is he in love with? <laughs> what is he in love with? And what does he want to tell the world? If he want to tell the world, about, what is he in love with? If you, if you don't believe for a moment that, that these people are uh, militant, They've told you this man, and they were, believe me, this is vanilla. When you get into Richard Dawkins, Christopher Hitchens, some other people we're going to discuss, these are the leaders, these are the preachers, these are the evangelists yeah. for this love. 
okay? And it's not so much a love for digging in the ground and finding bones and tectonic plates. This is a hate, not of Islam, not of Hinduism, Shintoism, <laughs> not of Buddhism, but of Christ. Right. Make no mistake about that. Uh, and, and these people are the evangelists. And they are in love with the, with the prospect of alienating, isolating, and eventually persecuting you and I. Bill Nye is a child evangelist. Is it? That's a, he has a children's ministry. He's a child, I, I'm just saying. He's, yeah, that's what I'm saying. He has a children's ministry. That's for the this children's life. ministry. He's, he's that's very, for, that's, the, for the, uh, the church, the religion of that one. If you want to draw, this, if you want to draw this analogy, that is what it is. He is the Sunday school superintendent for this love. He's the children's evangelist. For this love. Now, now, do we stoutly defend? Because I assure you, I assure you, they are stoutly offending. Right. They are. They are on the offense. We will stoutly defend if we. Uh, that's why we are having this class. Okay. I know we're in Searcy, Arkansas. This is not a huge university, and and maybe there's. You look at this little group. You say, what can we do? Well, we will start if no one else does. We will have an intelligent, mm -hmm. intelligent answer and a stout. Defense that I assure you they will not have an answer for. Mm -hmm. And now we're going to give you some biblical views, okay? When they, I, I made the, the, the statement last week when uh, when they uh, put up these uh, dinosaur bones, these skeletal uh, remains of these dinosaurs. You very seldom they find a complete dinosaur uh, skeleton. They'll find a bone here and a bone there, and they fill in the blanks with. They manufacture some of the bones, and then they will further extrapolate what it, where the muscle and sinew were, and where the eyes and the, 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 the shape and the skin, and they further extrapolate some other things until they can produce for you a replica of a dinosaur that lived billions and billions of years ago. Okay? Uh, so what I'm going to do when we are discussing alternative views, I'm going to go into Scripture. The, 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 this book that we read is only about yay thick, and it covers the entire history of man, even into the future of man into eternity. Mm -hmm. So that's a remarkable feat. Yes. The Bible is remarkable for no other reason for its brevity. Yes. It can cover it can cover the history of the entire world, even into the future, in one volume, and and stand the critique of millennia yes. without being disproved. It's an incredible, incredible document. Uh, now. We're going to what we're going to do. We're going to go through the scripture, and we are going to build a skeleton. Because obviously, a book this thick, it cannot fill in every blank. But it gives us. It, it, we can dig up these truths. We can dig up these bones and put them together and extrapolate. Fill in those blanks. For instance, the created days, the first day, the evening and the morning with the first day, the evening and the morning with the second day. Now. We don't have, I don't guess I have time tonight to, to get into any alternative explanation. But let me say this in answer to the science guy here. Okay? Um, the, the old earth theory, the old earth um, philosophy, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, I don't see any, there is no uh, prohibition of that in Scripture. In fact, if God is old, I have no reason to believe that his creation the heaven of heavens is an old as well. And in the beginning, I don't know when in the beginning was. Right. I don't know, do you? It was just in the beginning. Now, the dinosaur bones, we're going to talk about that, but maybe I'll, I'll lay a little outline for you. In fact, I will tell you, when you go home, how many of you own a concordance? Hey, that's good. If you own a concordance, Go to, let me get the right verse for you. This is kind of, we're going to talk about this next week, and we're going to get into some explanations. We'll do some more. We are making this up as we go. We do not have a written, we're not making it up, but we are. <laughs> we're going at our own pace, and we're, anyway. <laughs> we're going to get heavy into creationism, okay? There is a reason, Brother John. If I thought I was right and you were wrong, and over any issue, no matter what it was, if I thought I had the truth and the facts, and you believed the lie, I would walk over broken glass on bare feet to get you in front of a, a group of people like this 
and demonstrate that I was right and you were wrong. Would you not? Yes. I would do anything because there's no, there was no great. If I am confident that I'm right and you were wrong, I would welcome you. I would I would take you with me. You could ride in the front seat of my car. I'd take you with you everywhere I go. And you would be my best example as to why I'm right. You would be my best witness. If, if the Darwinists were confident in Darwinism, the creationists would be their best witness. Yes. They would lobby to have creationism included in studies, included in textbooks, to demonstrate. Yes. Okay? Because the facts will speak for themselves. There is a reason why they will not engage. It is not even allowed to be brought up. In fact, in meeting, the public schools put the little stickers on the biology books that says uh, Darwinism is a theory. They were taken to court. BB public schools were taken to court just a few years ago and forced to remove the little stickers that, that stated that Darwinism was a theory. Because that might introduce in someone's mind that there is an alternative somewhere. That's insane, friends, to even let the question come into this little child's mind, this little future taxpayer's mind, <laughs> that there might be an alternative out there. There's a reason why they do not want to share the stage, because they know. If you've got no bullets in the gun, and, and you're facing an adversary, what are you going to do? You're just going to yell real loud, I'll shoot, I'll shoot, you better get back. If you had bullets in the gun, you'd be shooting Intimidation, intimidation is the tactic of the unarmed. Hope you understand what I just said there. Yes. Um, I'm going to give you a scripture here before we go. Uh, let's try. Genesis chapter... 1 verse 21. I don't have it to put on the screen there, but I'll read it to you. If you have a Bible, you can read it. If you have a concordance when you get home, it's 7 o'clock, so we are going to we're going to call this. We don't want to overstay our welcome here at the hotel. Oh, I'm enjoying this though. I, I'm getting used to it. I want to go on. Genesis 1 21. Get your concordance when you go home. And read this. It says, And God created the great whales. God created the great whales. Go home and look up the meaning of the word whales. You think, well, I don't know what a whale is. Well, look up the, what was translated here into English as whales. I'll tell you what you'll find when you find it to, to, verify, to, ver to uh, verify what I'm saying. Okay? The word whales was translated from a word which actually means giant reptiles, sea monsters, and dragons. Okay, the fifth day of creation, okay, was the time in which these dinosaurs created. We will talk about, please come next week, and I, I hope to get into some of this. If we don't get to it next week, we're getting to it. Be patient. We're going to give you real, solid, biblical answers that do make sense, and they are not crazy. Okay, but there is a place in the Bible that they, they stand up the straw man and say, well, these people don't believe the dinosaurs existed. No, the Bible says they existed. Right. They existed in the fifth day. Well, you say, well, how could they exist in the fifth day? I'm a believer. I, I, I may cross theological swords with others. Uh, I'm a believer that uh, the each day of creation was not a 24-hour day. In fact, it will, you won't find, it appears as though the 24-hour day was created in the fourth day says when he created it, he said he called the night, mm -hmm. the darkest night, and he called the light day. It wasn't until the fourth day that the solar day was created. Okay, so I believe that each of these days, in fact, I can prove to you, I believe this, that we now live within the sixth day of creation. We are still in the sixth day. It has been going on for about 6,000 years or more. Okay, uh, and I can, I can, I uh, can, uh, Verify that by this verse. Well, we gotta go, we gotta go, we gotta go. We'll get to this next week, okay? It's at 703. You're, you're fast. Okay, hey, hey, hey. I'll drop it.
Yeah. 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 These things are of the devil anyway. Don't know that. Um, look with me at, um, uh, at Genesis chapter five. And again, I, I, I'm going to use the old school stuff. Oh. The word day, and we're going to study this in depth next week. The Hebrew word yom, um, which doesn't necessarily refer to a solar day. It's a defined period of time, evening and morning. But look at what it says in Genesis chapter 5 and verse 1. This, is, and we've just finished the creation story, the story of Adam and Eve, the story of a temptation and the fall the birth of his children. We've just covered that in the first four chapters. And then the Bible, only then, it's kind of like if you saw a movie and you have uh, you have the opening scene, you know, where the cowboy is shooting it up and he's laying under the wagon. And then comes from Columbia Pictures. The hat, not the cowboy. And they introduced it. Starring <laughs> Timotheos. Watch <Walks> that. <laughs> okay? And they introduced the movie. That's the way the Bible is. You have the opening scene, this great, great. Who knows how long it took? It could have taken, we don't know. We'll, we'll talk about that, the possibility of that next week. Okay, but after all of that, you have the opening scene, the creation, humanity, all the all the terraform, all of that being created, the heavens and the earth then the fall of man, and then featuring. This is the book. This, I want you to understand, I've talked this to our church, I, I want you to get this. This is the book of the generations of Adam in the day God created man. In the likeness of God made he him. Male and female created he them. And blessed them, and he called their name Adam in the day when they were created. Okay? He said, We're going to start recording right now the genealogies, the generations, the genealogies of Adam in the day that he was created, in the day they were created. And Adam lived in 130 years with God in his own likeness after his image, and and got some in his own, own likeness, called his name Seth. And the days of Adam. After he had begotten Seth, were 800 years, and he begot sons and daughters, and all the days that lived were 930 years, and he died, and Seth lived. And there we go with those old boring genealogies. Those boring genealogies. And so and so begot, so and so begot, so and so begot. So and so. What did the Bible just say? He said, This is the book of the genealogy of Adam. In the day, this is a record of the sixth day creation. In the day Adam was created, in the day he created them. This is the record. This book, now that, that's why it starts off. It goes through, you, you read it, and the next time you read Genesis, you pick it up, you start where I started. You have the opening act, and then you have the presenting, the book of the genealogies of Adam, and Adam begot Seth, and Seth begot him, and on it goes. The begots, the begots, the begots, the begots, it keeps on going, and then we got Noah. Oh, and something really interesting happened during while this guy was alive. <laughs> something very. Let me stop for this. Let me stop the genealogies for a moment, and let me explain some real interesting men. The the, the the sons of God had come and 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 had sexual relations with the with the daughters of men, and giants were born, and the world became very violent, and very evil. Till men's mind was only evil continually, and God said, "I will wipe them away." So it stops, the great flood comes, this water subsides, and, and Noah comes off the ark, and, and the ham does something really nasty. And then Japheth begot so and so. It picks right back up, and it goes right on. This is the book of Jesus. And then it goes on down, and so up, so and so begot, so and so begot, so and so begot, so and so begot. Abraham. Oh, there's a real interesting story with Abraham. Abraham. It's a real interesting story. He lived in, in Babylon and in Ur, and, and God called him out of there. And, and it's really, he had this kid. And he talks about, you know, this promise was made to him. And it's, his name was Isaac, so Abraham got Isaac. And Isaac lived a little while. He was really, he had an interesting situation because he had, he had twins. <laughs> 
And so tell the story of those two boys, how they grew up and, and all that stuff. But then Jacob begot. Jacob's name was changed to Israel and begot children. And they became the children of Israel. And they were, damn, that's your knife. God, Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun, Jack, Gad, Simeon, and Reuben, and Benjamin, Ephraim, and Manasseh. And they became the 12 tribes of Israel. And it gives the genealogies of, it gave the genealogies of all their, it gives the people of the tribes, the clans, and they read it. Ephraim, read about it, every clan, every family that is in his tribe. And it goes on. Those, it picks up the, as soon as it finishes with Jacob, it picks up the genealogies and it keeps on rolling. Get into the book of Chronicles, get into all through the Old Testament, even all the way up to the book of Luke, chapter 3. It will give the genealogies all the way from Adam till 2,000 years ago. There's no other document in the world that can do that right. or anything close. Right. Now, so this is the book of the genealogies of Adam in the day that he was created. Now, it stopped in Luke chapter 3. There are, that was the very last genealogy. Luke chapter 3. We, we, we're, we're giving you an overview today. All right. Woo! <laughs> Pop! Okay. <laughs> the genealogies end in Luke chapter 3. Does anybody know why? Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ was the last one of the genealogy. Okay. Why does it stop there? Well, oh, Jesus didn't have any kids. Oh, yes. <laughs> He's given us all the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba. Right. Come on now. We are being written into the genealogy of the Adam in the day that he was created. Yes. We are in that genealogy. We are in this book. We are, we are, it is still being written. Everybody that he adopts is a part of the genealogies of the sixth day. And this book goes on to tell us the conclusion of the sixth day. It tells us what will happen when this world is completed. What time is it? I don't know. Well, yeah. Keep going. Of course, go. It tells us how this day concludes. The elements will melt with a fervent heat, and the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and all of these things shall be dissolved. Right. Seeing that all these things shall be dissolved, what men or persons ought we to be in all holy conversation? Right. And godliness. Yes. So. You have the evening and the morning, the evening and the morning for the first day, the second day, the third day, the fourth day, the fifth day, and here we are, boys and girls, in the sixth day. And I believe we can prove in the scripture that we are living out the history of the sixth day. These are the genealogies. It was all the way to Christ, and Christ adopts us, and we are in this day. And we see the conclusion of this day and what is the time period in which it will happen. And so if we can figure out that this is an old teaching of S.G. Norris here, if we can figure out the duration of this sixth day, how long it lasts, if we can track human history back to the, the beginning of the sixth day, if the evening and the morning were the sixth day, we can, and, and we can figure out durations, what the fifth, the evening morning was the fifth, and the evening morning was the fourth, and the evening morning was the third, the second, and the first, right? So if you say, let's just say, if we could show that this day here was 88 gazillion years, <laughs> then we would know this one's 88 gazillion years. And this one's 88 gazillion years. All we got to do is add up 88 gazillion. Six times, bang, age of the earth. Okay. But what we don't know, are there gaps between these days? Was there time periods when the earth regenerated itself? Or there, uh, we don't know. We don't know. I mean, uh, we don't know. Okay, was there a great period of time from this time that's called the beginning and the actual first day? The solar day was created right here. That's when the sun, the moon, it was called day and the dark was called night. Okay, so I don't believe these were solar days. The solar day was created right here. The dinosaurs that Mr. Nye looks at these poor, uninformed, they were created right here. And then one day, well, that, was, but, but that couldn't be because all of that organic material that, that produces coal and oil and natural gas and all that stuff, you know, it, it takes billions of tons of heat and pressure to, to transform that organic material into carbon that we use as fuel. So we know, well, maybe could it, could it have been that, that the 
heavens melted with a perfect heat. And the heavens passed away with a great noise. If it happened in the sixth day. If we know how the sixth day ended, is it logical to believe that's how the fifth day ended and the fourth day ended? Science itself teaches us that there have been five. You read it. Bill Nye will agree with this, that there have been five major cataclysms on the earth. The Bible tells us the same. The dinosaurs and all the other organic materials, they, they lived in the sixth day. Okay? Or the fifth day, rather. And there was a great cataclysm at the end of the fifth day. As there will be at the end of the sixth day. Well, what about, I thought there were seven days of creation. I'm done. <laughs> I thought there were seven days of creation, and there are. But there's one major difference. Can anybody tell me what the difference in the seventh day is in the first six? Yes. It never ends. There's no evening, there's no evening and morning. That's what we call boys and girls eternity. Eternity. We are on the edge of eternity. But it wasn't 88 years, it was 80 years. Talk further about maybe how long it was. Give Brother Walk Center a big hand tonight. <laughs> All right. Because Bill Nye, Bill Nye stands up, quite a few straw men in here, and puts words in our mouth and then debates those words. Right. If we don't believe in dinosaurs, who in here don't believe in dinosaurs? Well, Christians don't believe in dinosaurs. What are you, nuts? <laughs> Of course we believe in dinosaurs. Are you crazy? <laughs> Christians can't make things. Christians can't be engineers, architects. Can't pay taxes either. <laughs> We're this, way, this, far, this far away from persecution. It's time to mount a stout defense. Yes. Okay, we're going to build a stout defense. Amen. Lift up your hands, Father. We love you tonight. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your word. We're here to hear your voice, Lord. Lord, I just pray that you would bless everybody in this house today, Lord. Give us your knowledge. Give us your wisdom that we may stout defense, earnestly contend with the faith that was once delivered. So we pray in the name of the Lord Jesus.